Okay, hi everyone. And Partners for Progressive Israel is proud to be sharing my tree as a pre-symposium feature along with this interview and Q&A with the film's director, Jason Sherman, and the historian, Paul Sham. I welcome you, all of you who have signed up for the Israel-Palestine Symposium 2022, as well as those of you who reg registered just to see the film and attend this particular event. Uh, my name is Ben Sharif. I'm a proud board member of Partners for Progressive Israel. Uh, and before I introduce the panelists, I want to uh, uh, say a brief note about Partners. Uh, Partners for Progressive Israel is an American not-for-profit that seeks to bring voices from Israel and Palestine to an American and international audience, providing an important link, bet link between key government, NGO, and grassroots leaders from the Middle East to deepen our understanding of the complexities facing the region. Over 30 years ago, my late grandfather, Harold Shapiro, took the initial group to Israel-Palestine to have a first-hand political and societal experience unlike any other, and the symposium has continued year after year. While it's difficult for us right now to organize in-person visits since the outbreak of the pandemic, we're still continuing the tradition virtually. Today is sort of a prologue for this year's journey, and I believe my tree is the perfect starting place for us. If you haven't signed up for the symposium, which is this year is titled The Struggle for Human Rights, From Declaration to Occupation, then I encourage you to check it out, and you can find details on our website at progressiveisrael.org, and we'll add a link into the chat. Uh, the symposium sessions begin this Sunday, October 23rd, and we hope that you will... We hope that you will leave this webinar with knowledge that will support you in advocating for partners' mission of a durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors, as well as the ensuring of civil rights, equality, and societal justice for all inhabitants of the region. So let me briefly explain the format for this session. As moderator, I'll pose some initial questions to our panelists, and you all can keep your questions in mind. And following the initial conversation, we'll, you'll have the opportunity to ask them directly. Uh, I invite you to, once we get to this portion of the session, uh, you can click on the reactions button towards the bottom of your screen and press, press the raise hand button. Uh, to virtually raise your hand, or if you want to physically raise your hand, I will try to keep an eye on the, uh, the, your different boxes. And if you'd rather me read your question out loud, you can type it in the chat and I'm, I'm more than happy to read it for you. Um, throughout the uh, duration of this q and when you're not asking a question, I do ask that you please keep your sound on mute to avoid uh, any cross communication or disturbances. Um, so now let me begin by introducing today's panelists. Uh, first, Jason Sherman is a celebrated playwright and screenwriter with a multi-award winning body of work for the stage and screen. His feature documentary, My Tree, uh, which is about his search for the tree that was planted in his name in Israel, premiered at the 2021 Hot Docs Festival before going on to play at festivals across Canada. It won the 2022 Canadian Screen Award for Best Editing in a Feature Documentary and was nominated for the Best Documentary Feature. Jason also wrote the docudrama We, we Were Children about Canada's residential school systems, as well as numerous TV series. Among his internationally produced plays are Reading Hebron, The League of Nathans, It's All True, and Three in the Back, uh, It's All True and Three in the Back, Two in the Head, which won the Governor's General's Award for Drama. He also created and wrote a number of radio dramas for the CBC, including two long-running series, National Affairs and Afghan Afghanada. Paul Sham is the director of the Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Studies at the University of Maryland and a professor at Israel Studies. His primary interest is in the history and current politics of Israel and of the Israel-Israeli-Palestinian conflict. For the last few years, he has focused on the historical narratives of the two sides, co-editing two books and publishing a number of articles. He also co-authored the USIP special report on Hamas in 2009. And from, two th in, from excuse me, 1996 to 2002, he lived in Jerusalem and coordinated Israeli-Palestinian and Israeli-Jordanian joint research projects at the Truman Institute for the Advancement of Peace at the Hebrew University. Paul is also president of uh, the current president of Partners for Progressive Israel. Uh, so first now, I'd like to start by asking Jason um, a question, a couple questions, and then we'll come to Paul. 
Um, so Jason, thank you again for being here today uh, to discuss your, your wonderful film with us. Um, first, I'd like thank to you. ask- and, how... Sorry, can I, I, sorry to interrupt, but oh, I just please. want to say hi and thanks uh, partners for including the film in the conference and to everyone who's uh, taking part today. Cool. Yeah. Um, we're, we're so happy to have you here for this conversation. Um, I'd first like to ask you uh, about how this idea of, of turning such a personal journey into a documentary came about for you. Um, it started with a thought that came to me while I was in Israel. Um, and I think it was my first trip, uh, which I took about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I was invited to Israel to take part in a theater festival, actually to watch a bunch of plays uh, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Haifa. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on buses and in dark rooms. Um, and so now that I think of it, I think that it was the second trip that I took because that first one was just sort of like a, a taste. And because I didn't see very much of the actual country, um, I decided to go back and see it for myself with, on my own agenda. And having had a longstanding interest in writing about um, Israel and Israel-Palestine and the occupation, and the relationship between diasporic Jews and Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I thought, okay, now's the time for me to go and see the place for myself. And because the, you mentioned um, in my bio a couple of plays that I'd written um, on those issues, one of which was reading Hebron uh, about the, the Hebron massacre. And so I wanted to go, and, and so the plays were really about, again, it was, it, it, about the relationship between the diaspora and Israel, Palestine. So, so now I went to see it for myself. And it was when I was on that trip and going hither and yon and including for the first time ever to places like Hebron, you know, and Tel Aviv that I had this kind of dual thought uh, all the time in the, while being there, which was, yes, I'm feeling this deep connection here uh, understandably, because when you grow up in a place like Toronto, in the Jewish community, uh, Israel is a uh, you know, large part of the, your identity. Um, and so it's, you know, it, for me, it's akin to going to London for the first time, having read Dickens and, you know, all, all the other great English authors that you read in school. And then suddenly you're walking on the same streets that they're writing about. And so it was the same thing. But on the, my other shoulder was someone saying, "You, you know, what are what? I mean, how are you actually connected here? And you know, you were manipulated all those years, and it was, you know, you were being, you know, brought into a way of thinking and so on. So I had this sort of tug of war going on in my head, and as part of that, I started to think about what my real connection was to, like actual tangible connection, and as lighthearted as it might seem to say it was the tree that came into my head you know literally the only thing that tied me to Israel was the tree because I remembered in that moment that I had a tree planted there and so I thought what if I go and try to find the tree what is it going to tell me about the place my relationship to it in ways that I'd never explored before in all my other writing about Israel. Um, and I thought, I'll do it as a, you know, I'll make a record of it. So I'll do it as a documentary. And that's where it started. That's amazing. <laughs> wow, yeah. quite a journey. Yes. <laughs> as, a, <laughs> yeah. yes. As, a, as a filmmaker, I know that it, uh, documentaries in particular take a long time to develop and, and, and mm -hmm. see through. Yes, especially um, when they're being solely funded by arts councils. Yeah. And friends and family. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, yeah. the personal journey was is certainly worthwhile. And as a diaspora Jew myself, I, I often find myself asking these questions about what our 
role is in, in the complexities of the situation, especially when you hear about all the human rights violations uh, being committed in the name of Jewish people. Um, and so you allude to this a bit in the film, uh, but I wanted to ask you directly how your relationship with your own religious identity and connection to the state changed uh, after making the film, if at all. Um, I don't know that it's changed. Um, I'm not, um, I mean, I, I guess, depending on how we're defining or using the word religious, um, you know, I am one of those diasporic Jews who saw, uh, you know, uh, his bar mitzvah as um, a chance to get out of uh, going to synagogue. Uh, because then I was given the opportunity to decide for, for myself whether I wanted to go or not. So that may tell you a little bit about my um, <clears throat> commitment to uh, uh, the religious aspects. I, I'm, I'm a secular, I'm a, you know, full-on full you know, secular Jew. I like the cultural aspects of it, the religious aspects of it, not so much. You know, you know, the, you know, saying Kaddish, you know, uh, for my parents, it's a very moving experience until, you know, if you sit back and read the words, uh, which are, you know, extolling God and have nothing to do with the, the person you're um, speaking these moving words over. Um, so uh, the, I think all really what changed in the making of the film was my recognition that for all that I thought I knew, about the place, I had a lot more to learn, and um, specifically about the the JNF, uh, the Jewish National Fund, uh, Karen came at Le Israel, as it's known in Israel, and the role that it has played, continues to play, apparently will continue to play um, in Israel and Palestine, and because I was brought into the their processes of control, um, the role that um, I had unwittingly uh, played in having a tree planted there to cover up, uh, be part of a cover up. Um, so that is kind of what I discovered in the making of the film. Um, and that's, you know, what's captured on film. And, and you know, I'll just say that, you know, as much as I can read about it, have conversations about it, it was only being there and on the very spot, as you see in the film, that although in a, in a sense it's random, the tree that I choose, because I don't, you know, there wasn't a sign on it saying this is my tree, but clearly that was the place where my, tr my tree would have been planted, that it was a very moving uh, experience. And, you know, together with meeting someone who had been born there, and raised there and expected to live much of his life there. Uh, and his reflections on his uh, displacement and the destruction of his home. Yeah, those those were the things that surprised me the most. That's amazing. I think that we can all take a lesson from your book in that it's, it's really, it, it takes active learning and, and critical thinking about these issues to really dive deep and, and reveal um, how complicit we we often are um, just sub unconsciously um, and it, it takes that work to really understand and and uh, I think it, it um, to to really fully encompass our our Jewish obligation of being uh, you know of, of thinking of social justice and whatnot it's I think it's such an important journey for everyone to take uh, my next question for you is uh, about the the interview with Harris D. Gulko and why you felt that that was important to include in this piece. It seems to me it stood out as very a very different perspective than many of the other interviews that you featured, um, and uh, sometimes uh, at times ignorant of certain facts. Uh, but but why did you feel that that interview was particularly important? Well. So Harris D. Galco was um, the uh, long-standing executive director of Jewish National Fund of Canada. And in that role, he was responsible for 
uh, coming up with both the idea for Canada Park and raising the funds for it, as he very uh, gleefully uh, describes um, and proudly describes in the course of the interview. I had been, as you know from the film, uh, although I probably I might have hit this harder, I don't know, uh, but I, I think it, you know it's pretty clear from the film that I took great pains to um, include the Jewish National Fund in the film. You know, it's their forest. And I wanted someone, anyone, preferably someone in a position of authority, um, you know, along with a forester uh, to walk me through Canada Park, just as uh, someone from, you know, uh, an activist organization does and, and explains to me the existence of the villages. But I wanted them on film to tell me about their parks and their work from their point of view. I think, you know, I, I'm not a strict adherent to um, the idea of balance in a documentary. It's I am telling a story, but at the same time, and, and, and balance is such a, you know, it's in the mind's eye uh, that uh, for some people, you know, even if I had included the Jewish national, someone from the JNF currently, if they had consent, I should say, if they had consented to participate in the film, uh, still wouldn't have been seen as balanced. From my experience in theater, as soon as, you know, when you're writing about these issues, as soon as you have the Palestinian point of view expressed, you're presenting an imbalanced point of view. So, um, th you know, that's neither here nor there. However, I did think it was important to not just have me, you know, um, as I end up having to do early in the film, do a kind of potted history of the JNF with, you know, select, you know, historical images and so on. I wanted someone from the JNF right now to tell me about all of the things they do. They refused over and over, you, you know, including right here in my own town, Toronto, um, after agreeing to participate in the film and then not liking what this person thought the direction of the film was going of, of the interview was going to take, canceling it right there. And then anyway, um, I, you know, so ultimately I tracked down Harris Galko because he, in a way, even if I had um, managed to um, get someone from the Jane after agree to be in a film, in a way, Harris Galko is the more relevant voice the more relevant spokesperson for the JNF because he's the guy that built the forest, you know, not with his own hands, but he raised the money, um, quite a lot of money. And over the years, um, kept the trees coming. Um, and I think it's important to understand the mindset of the people that uh, put up the forest, you know, to, to accept his word um he didn't know about the villages uh but at the same time he had just been told that the area had been taken so i i'm not sure how you square those two things but he certainly seems to be at peace with the idea that we had just suddenly been given this land this barren land and now we'd like to uh, make sure that uh, no one else gets to occupy it other than us so put up a forest um that's why I, I just I felt it was very important to have that voice uh, in the film. Absolutely, and I, I am glad you included it, and also as well as your numerous, <clears throat> excuse me, your numerous attempts at trying to get uh, cooperation with the uh, JNF. Uh, I think their unwillingness to cooperate is uh, just as telling. Um, yeah, and, and so it's, it's odd because sorry, I know I know you want to move no, on, but the the, the you know. I had, as part of my research, I'd read, you know, there's not a shelf full of books, but about uh, the JNF, but there, are, there, there were enough to, you know, take up a lot of time reading and and contacting the authors and and arranging for interviews, which unfortunately fell through for very different reasons. But um, those authors didn't have any trouble getting access to JNF ar archives. Uh, interviews with JNF representatives. Now, interestingly, those books were from, you know, at least a decade ago. So something has happened in the 
intervening years to make them cautious about um, allowing uh, someone like me to uh, to come and and uh, interview them for the record. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Jason. At this point, I'm gonna I want to turn it over to Paul uh, for his historical and and personal perspective about uh, uh, Canada Park, uh, actually. I'd like to uh, spend a minute actually on my own journey because I'm also a, a diaspora Jew. I grew up with a connection to Israel that I really didn't start exploring until I was almost 38 years old. And what fascinated me almost from the beginning is the clash of narratives that in the larger sense that I think Jason saw uh, that focus on the dispossession, the Nakba of 1948. So I focus my own professional work on Israeli and Palestinian narratives, as well as being active in peace movement. But uh, I consider myself a supporter of uh, Israel, even though uh, obviously people with a right-wing perspective may not see, see it that way. And just one more sense, uh, a sentence on this. Jason is absolutely right that in the last 10 or so years, attitudes have hardened on both sides and instead of encouraging inquiry, the uh, institutions like JNF are circling the wagons in many ways. So on the film, I was impressed by both how you hit the important uh, historical aspects very uh, uh, well, and that you included views, uh, different views, including the clueless uh, uh, interview with Harris Galico, who, as I understood it, he could not accept that what he had devoted his life to was in some ways a lie. And he also mixed up what happened in 48 in the Nakba as a whole when perhaps 600 villages I've heard different estimates between 400 and 600 were essentially destroyed and largely grown over either deliberately by JNF or uh, just allowed to uh, vegetate after being physically destroyed. One point I'd like to make that was made in, uh, in the film about the three villages, it, it may have seemed like an excuse uh, 
that was over the road to Tel Aviv. The fact is Israel didn't know in the wake of the Six Day War what might happen to the uh, uh, to the West Bank? It was sort of assumed it would go back to someone that it wouldn't remain in the Israeli hands, and so Israel decided that before any decisions were made about the U.S. Bank, it would uh, create facts on the ground and it, it make sure that those three villages wouldn't be returned, that there wouldn't be people there because the, of its very strategic location. Finally, I happened when I lived in Israel in uh, 60, in 1996 to 2002, my wife, who's an archaeologist, was in, involved with Zohrot, the uh, memory uh, institution that uh, was uh, discussed in the film, and she wrote uh, an, at least one article, and we actually went down, she and I and our then uh, three or four year old daughter with a group of Palestinians and Israelis to clean the uh, cemetery at Imwas. And so we were there, we heard uh, about it. It's important in the New Testament, which is where Jesus was uh, after his uh, uh, rising uh, after uh, supposedly met with two uh, people and they had a conversation. So it is a name known in the uh, a Christian world. And uh, also this in 67, after the Six Day War, unlike in 48, Israel did not uh, generally destroy uh, villages. There were these three. I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying that most of the destruction that's remembered in the Nakba happened in 1948, and the uh, situation was very different in 67. What, we got, what Israel got after 67 was the occupation, the great victory turned into a millstone around the Israel's neck that's still uh, there. Thank you, Paul. That's a very interesting history, and I'm sure that was a profound experience to uh, be there in person to, to clean up the cemetery um, and uh, to have a direct contact there and, and learn on the ground. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up, open the Q&A up to audience members. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand again by using the uh, uh, function in the react, by clicking the reactions button and pressing raise hand, or uh, if you want to just actually physically raise your hand, I can, we can unmute you uh, and invite you to speak. Ayala. <laughs> Hi. 
Thank you very much, Jason, for the movie. I really appreciate it. And I have a question for you about the issue of complicity and uh, imp implications. So, and that's, I'm talking not about Israelis, I shift the focus to American Jews, Canada and the United States. It's very clear that implicating, lying all the time was an implication and making them partners in a secret that they had no idea they were part of. But my question is about when do you become complicit? Because I see it not as a deliberate originally from, the, from your film, as implicating Jews basically, not telling them the truth, hiding facts from them. Now that your film is out and probably people can find the facts and the truth, what do you think is going on in the Jewish diaspora that they take the step for being implicated to being consciously complicit? Yeah, well, thank you uh, for the question. I think, if I understand you correctly, that you go from, um, I think complicity kicks in when you know the facts and then either fail to act upon them or deny them outright and um, remain, either remain silent about what is clearly, um, you know, in, in the case of Canada Park and the events that led to it, um, uh, uh, wrong and, and more than wrong, uh, it's, you know, a war crime. Uh, by any you know by international definition um so if you know what took place and um keep it to yourself as john goddard explained to me in a moment that i wish i had in the film but unfortunately couldn't put in which is that he was there one time on a cheroot passing canada park he overheard a conversation between a married couple behind him that went something like this. The husband said, oh, honey, this Canada Park. I think we have, I think we've donated trees to Canada Park. And his wife said, shh, don't talk about that. So that's complicity. Um, and, but then there's the outright denialism um, and uh, rationalizing the actions, which I think is what we see from Harris Galco, which is another reason I think it's important that we have a voice like that in the film. You know, I have been asked, uh, what, you know, do I wish I had been more pointed in my um, conversation with him and, for example, you know, challenged him on what he had to say about Arabs who fled uh, in 48, which, you know, um, he does. He does indeed conflate with '67, and even the issue, you know, the 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 myth of the fleeing Arabs from '48 and all that is questionable. But um, I um, I wanted to a I, I wanted to you know just hear his beliefs. But the other thing is that I, I thought about this, and if I had been more pointed example, I think he simply retreats to the position of um, we were there first, which he already stated. So in a way, you know, so, so, so there are, and there are a lot of people like him who take the position that um, not only were we there first, but it was given to us by God. So, you know, th those people will never see themselves as complicit, but of course, you know, that attitude leads you to do things like destroy, you know, take and destroy villages that have been standing there for thousands of years um, and removing its occupants and then trying to deny the fact that they were there to begin with and then continuing to deny the fact that they were there to begin with um, or that they are who they say they are and so on. So that's the, that's the dividing line for me and why it was so important 
just from a kind of personal point of you know point of view for me to find out from John Goddard in this case the the, the journalist if you know what Canadians knew and by extension Americans and the entire diaspora knew about um, those villages in that time and of course you know they knew nothing so you can also say if you want to be a bit harder line about it all well you should go and find out you know you shouldn't just accept that you know what what a charity organization is telling you as the truth and yes it's it, especially these days it's quite easy to go and do a little googling or uh you know however it is you get your your information do your research and and discover that the things you're being told are either not true or um, not being addressed or, or you know or not being accurately represented so um I, I so that for me is 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 the story is is where it trips into complicity Ben, I'd like to say something about that as well. I come at it from a more academic perspective as well as a personal one. I, I'm an American Jew actually living in Israel. I acquired Israeli citizenship, which mainly means I pay Israel value added tax. And that's about it. I, I have tried as an American Jew to make American Jews especially more aware of what's uh, happened, but at the same time, not seeing Israel as a, a solely guilty entity. And that's an intermediate position of the sort in that I think what you say in the true in the film is true and should be known, and I think it's very much getting known. And I, however, there is also a country of Israel and six or seven million. Israeli Jews, most of whom were born there. So I don't think it's a simple answer to make it known. It's also a policy question. How do you get justice for Palestinians who are still the ones suffering the most from the Nakba, but also retain Israel. I'm a proponent of confederation. I'd be the first one to acknowledge we're a very long way from any justice for Palestinians. Yeah, and I think you hit on something there that is really key to, you know, why I wanted to make the film, which is, or or at least why having discovered what I did in setting out to make the film, I wanted to share it, which is until the these stories are are told, until the Palestinian narrative is known, um, I don't know how we get to the next part of of uh, restorative justice and um you know a, a palestinian state whatever form that's going to take because the overwhelming view of palestinians is still the one that's been with us since you know the plo was blowing up planes and murdering israeli athletes now if you look at polling in the u.s you can see that there is a you know interesting thing happening generationally that there are certainly more um younger american jews who are starting to 
understand the other story um, and, and how that's affecting uh, th uh, their attitudes and support. But uh, still a long way to go, but at least getting this, you know, again, I'll quote something that's not in the film, but Eitan Bronstein from Zuchrot said, you know, it's all about stories here. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think he's right. And, and, and for so long, the Palestinian story was not told. And it's, and I, you know, I, I'm just, you know, one small part of it. And, and after many, you know, coming to the game a bit late with, with my film, but um, many people have been trying to tell the story and, and um, you know, uh, telling it quite well and powerfully. Um, yet, it's still hard to get you know, breakthrough, um, that, which is why I'm so glad that, for example, it's part of this conference. I wish it were also true of other, you know, like Palestinians know the story. They, and the ones I have spoken to are very appreciative of, of the film. Jewish organizations, by and large, even the most quote unquote liberal ones, liberal minded ones are, Kind of doing what the woman on the shroot did, which is shh, don't talk about that. So you know, because as we sit here today, the film has been invited to more Palestinian film festivals than Jewish ones. Interesting. Make of that what you will. Very interesting point. Um, and uh, I I see that we had a, a question come into the chat. I don't know, if, Joyce, if you want to unmute. Uh, and ask it, or if you'd like me to ask it. And then I also see that Ilana and Jack Miller have their hand raised and we'll come to you after. Joyce. I, okay, I'm unmuted. Um, uh, and Jason, first of all, congratulations on the film. I saw it. And then shortly thereafter, I saw Blue Box. And I was stunned by the parallels and the fact that the, um, your, the, the second film uh, was like the underpinning of everything you said on a personal basis and being Canadian and being Jewish and, you know, giving gifts of trees, uh, your film resonated so incredibly powerfully with me. And then when I saw Blue Box, I thought, like, is this a team effort? Because the groundwork and the research, which just emphasizes everything that you had done in a more personal journey was so powerful. And I wondered what your relationship with that film is and the filmmaker and her engagement with this issue and have you discussed this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, Blue Box, I was aware of, um, I became aware of around the same time that I was starting to um, seek financing for my film. Uh, I went to the Hot Dogs International Film Festival here in Toronto, and this is probably going back eight years or so as I was just starting to, you know, look for money to, to make the film. And I, I pitched it to a commissioning editor from an Israeli documentary channel who said, who said two things. One, uh, Israelis aren't going to be interested in a film by a Canadian Jew about what's going on over here. And two, someone else is making a film about the JNF and she's the granddaughter of the guy who started it all. So, bye. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, I mean, he, he wasn't that blunt, but he was pretty blunt. So I said, okay, great. And then the film Blue Box has kind of been shadowing me ever, ever since. And I say that with, with the greatest respect because it's a fantastic film. I mean, she did a, um, an amazing job and they are, I, I think of the two films as, uh, kind of two parts of, of, of a whole, if you will. Uh, they both happened to debut at Hot Docs uh, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I have since had the pleasure of actually interviewing her for the Toronto Jewish Film Festival. Um, uh, both of our films were, were shown at the Toronto Jewish Film Festival. And it's, it's really fascinating. And actually, I'll just share something with you briefly um, about um, her, and I'm, uh, she won't mind me sharing this because we've re recorded that interview, obviously, for, for the festival. But you'll recall in, in Blue Box, there's a, one of the gentlemen that she uh, interviews uh, is uh, very upset with her and says, I'm, you know, I'm stopping this interview. 
right? And he doesn't storm off, but more or less. And he doesn't want to take part in the film anymore. Well, I asked her about that. I said, who was that guy? She said, that was my dad. Um, <laughs> he, he, he wasn't identified as such in the film, right? Um, and I said, oh, what happened after that? She said, well, he's now the greatest advocate for the film because what happened? He saw it. And, and he saw what she was trying to do. And now she can't get him to shut up about the movie. And, and he's, you know, so, um, and, I, and I tell you that because I've had, like that to me is, is the response that I, I think a filmmaker wants is to, to put uh, before someone um, ideas and facts and, and truths that they have, are not familiar with, comfortable with, wanting to get familiar or comfortable with, and then having a change of mind and indeed a change of heart. And I have had similar responses to the film from people who came at it from a completely um, uh, ignorant, and I don't use the word pejoratively, but uh, you know, place regarding the history of, of the JNF right. um, and uh, the wider history, you know, there from from 48 and even from before 48 and and who have said to me I never realized there was another side to the story well um, I, I have to say I have to say that as I said I saw your film first and I responded on a very personal level and then I saw that film which was as if it was you know digging and um, approving everything that you had said and your images of the Arab villages and hers Etc. And the fact, you know, I guess she says in the film that there were many members of her family who just rejected the thing out of hand, or didn't realize that it was her father yeah. as well. But, but thank you for that. And thank you for the film. It's terrific and powerful, and I recommend it to everyone. So uh, I'm very grateful to you. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Oh, I think you're muted. You're muted. you're muted now, Ben. Ben, yeah, can't hear you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for the question, Joyce. Uh, and um, uh, for those of you who haven't seen Blue Box, I also it, I recommend it very much. And so now I'll ask Ilana and Jack to unmute themselves uh, and ask their question. Unmuted. Okay. Hi, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for the film. Um, it was amazing, Jason. Uh, and Paul, I don't know if you remember, I think we, I, we know you from um, Shalom Akshav a long time ago. And um, uh, I just wanna, um, we're sitting in Jerusalem right now, um, the last week and a half of a three month stay. Um, we've been in Israel many times and I did make Aliyah in 1965 for seven years. So it's another part of the story. Um, from a personal note, um, your story, and we did see Blue, Blue Box last year, and then yours, the juxtaposition of the two of them together, um, that was the kind of the Israeli side, but yours made it so personal from it, you know, that, that that's, this is us, if you saw the movie, this is, the, you know, this story, they kind of, this is our American story in a couple, you know, in, in the connection, but right now, Jack and I are on a journey of a very, uh, in the moment situation because we have four children, one passed away in, in December. And we've been on the peace kick for many years in many different venues um, on the American scene and trying to help the auxiliary side. Um, but within about a week of her passing away, um, our, we received no, numerous trees planted in her memory. Through JNF. Through JNF. And I was really upset because I know all about this. We read about it in True Isle, and uh, I think months, years ago, in uh, there was articles digging about it by True Isle. It was the foreword. We fought about it in our synagogue, and they're still using JNF locally, even though the rabbi says, you know, he know they know about it, and we serve in the Arts Committee in a Reform Synagogue in Parkland, Florida. But yet, um, the the good outweighs the bad. They have a big representation in JNF in, in Florida, and they feed 
um, they, they present, they have presentations and speakers. So it's easy to allow them to come into the synagogue and speak about JN, JNF and all the good work, okay? And just forget about that. But um, back to our current situation. So I called JNF and I, you know, in the United States. And I said, look, um, I don't want my trees that were in my daughter's name and, you know, in within past the green line. Okay, and this was the answer. They said they have no clue where it goes. They send the money over to KKL. KKL gives it to the land authority, I think agency in, and that's it. There's no way to do that. And I'm, you know, and then we, uh, a month later, we had a celebration of life for our daughter in the synagogue and more trees came in. And so I wrestle with what to do about that, how much fighting I want to do in the synagogue on the communal level. We, we got a lot of hostility and kickback from it when we tried a couple of years ago, bringing up the issues. And our personal level, I was going to go call, you know, Haaretz to make a thing, you know, about it. But um, I guess restorative justice on a personal level We've been going to a synagogue here, uh, Kol Neshama, it's Reform Synagogue, and um, they're starting a, a, a connection to a village in East Jerusalem called Wallage, which is not far from them, in, near Baca. And we're going down to um, next week planting three olive trees in that village as to honor our daughter's memory but as a, as a small thing of restorative justice. So my question would be on that long thing is, what do you think of that? It's not the big picture. It seems like it's impossible to fix it. You couldn't get to JF, I can't get any answers. And you're a lot more powerful than I am. So oh. what are the little- oh, No, I wouldn't use the P word at all with, with me. Okay. <laughs> so what do you think of the, on the people that know a small step in restorative justice by giving back at least three trees that are being, you know, and then we're going to go help with this, you know, other activities, wow. which is like, that's our, my story, my current story is still battling it. And by the way, we were contemplating going to KKL with signs saying, where are my trees going to go? We thought you might sue us for plagiarism. Uh, no, but if you do that, please make sure you take photos. I, um, yeah. That's amazing. That I think is kind of part and parcel with, with the planting of the olive trees. Um, th thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and may I say how sorry I am to hear about, you know, the passing of your daughter. I think it's a beautiful thing that you have done. You found a way to um, honor her and to deny the JNF uh, the, the cynical attempt to, um, you know, to, uh, take over her story. I mean, you know, to, to implicate her in, in what they're doing. Um, I think it is amazing. And I, I don't think any act it can be too small. Um, it, it doesn't sound small to me. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's quite powerful, especially in the context that you spoke about in your, when you get so much pushback in your community. Um, and I'm sure it's appreciated on the Palestinian side. Um, equally importantly. So, um, you know, when I was shooting the film, you know, the, the scenes in Israel, uh, a good friend of mine, who's also a playwright, um, uh, said to me, you should, you know, maybe one thing to think about, and I, you know, still was contemplating the overall story of the structure of the film and so on. He said, maybe what you're doing is, is committing an act of tikkun olam. And I hadn't thought of it in those terms until he said it. And it made so much sense, you know, that 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 is what I was doing in my own way. And I, I think that's what you're doing in your the work. The other thing, and then I'll end, is that I'm going to ask a rabbi that, yes, they have the, you know, people call the synagogue and actually can plan through the synagogue to JNF, there's a connection, to have another possibility. If you want to honor or have it let's have a donation to plant in Wallage or wherever so there or somewhere to help the Palestinians as a as a counterpart as an as an option. Amazing. 
Paul uh, a... wanted to add a few words, I believe. Yeah, uh, I certainly also share. I'm sorry uh, about your loss. I think your instinct of uh, rebelling against what was done and your uh, action is uh, very admirable. Marsha put in the chat that many organizations do have uh, drives to uh, plant uh, olive trees in uh, uh, Palestine. So I, I think that sort of response also as partners, one of the things that we do, we happen to be an organization that gets uh, a certain amount of seats in the, the World Zionist Organization, which controls in a certain ways the JNF. So we are almost literally in the belly of the beast something I personally rebel against, but uh, participate in because that's a way that we can try. We and some other progressive organizations try to control the JNF and have the influence on it. There are many ways inside, outside, whatever, but I think the good part is a individual actions like yours and also actions by organizations to try to prevent JNF from continuing what it's doing. Yeah. And and just one, one very small note, um, there is another film on the JNF and on the issue of the forests covering up villages. It's, uh, I believe it's from South Africa. It was out maybe within the last 10 years also. And it's called The Village Under the Forest. I'm pretty sure you can find it uh, on YouTube. Um, the village under the forest and in that film spoiler alert the people who go to israel from south africa to find their trees and locate the village where their trees the, the former village that their trees now stand over give their certif tree certificates to the villagers to do with as they as they will i I think they ultimately burn them or something like that. Or, or I think the, the holders of the certificates burn them. Something It's very, not doing justice to it, but it's very powerful and, and very much in line with the sort of thing you're, you're talking about. Thank you for uh, the question, uh, Ilona and Jack. And I echo my sentiments of uh, 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 condolences for for your daughter. Uh, and I want to uh, start wrapping up. Uh, and I want to first, uh, before I have my closing statements, I want to offer the up uh, to Jason, uh, and then Paul, if you have anything that you would like to say in closing before we say goodbye. I honestly, I just, I want to thank everyone here, you know, partners for, for making the film available. And for the the work that you do, and 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 for those who've taken time to uh, to join us today and and uh, share your stories and and your questions, I'm really appreciative. I you know, a final statement for me is the film itself. I just wanted to put out there um, the story uh, about someone who grew up with a certain set of beliefs. And, and what he thought were facts and discovered, he went on a journey uh, and discovered that what he'd been told were basically lies. 
and put it out there for people to do, you know, make, make of that what they will. Um, and I'm very, you know, gratified with the with the response so far. Um, so thank you. And I'd like to thank you, Jason, for making the film. Uh, I actually did something I don't often do. I watched the film a second time because I was talking uh, about it and was surprised how well it wore. The second time is well, I'd recommend it to everyone. My final thought is uh, it just that all of us on this call, and of course, literally millions of other Jews feel a connection to Israel of some sort. And it's important to make that connection comport with our own values, which is often hard to do. One thing that I hope people don't do is just say, the hell with Israel. Israel is a, a fact, and it's something that I, as a Jew, feel a strong connection to. And I very much appreciate actions like Alana's uh, and Jack's, and especially Jason's, in making the a truer version of the uh, clashing narratives available uh, to us uh, in a, a film. So uh, thank you, and thanks to Ben for moderating it, uh, and Dinesh for setting it uh, up. Yeah, well, it's honestly, it's my pleasure to to chat with both of you. And so in closing, I want to again, thank you both <laughs> for, for your time and for uh, such an engaging conversation. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dinesh, our uh, executive director at Partners, and to my fellow symposium committee members, Marsha G. Yerman, Karen Shapiro, Lenny Grob, Ayala Ahmet, and William Hawkhausen for creating the digital symposium and this uh, event today. A very special thank you to the patron circle sponsor, the Shapiro Family Foundation, and our friendship circle sponsors, David Abraham, Ayala Ahmet, Evelyn Gelman, Mark Gold, Claude Goldenberg, and William Hawkhausen. Oh, and Andrea London, as well as two anonymous contributors for your financial support and belief in partners in our digital symposium. And last but not least, I want to thank all of you for being here today. And I encourage all of you who have not signed up for the full symposium, which starts again on this Sunday, October 23rd, to do so. Uh, I hope to see you all there. And uh, thank you again for such uh, a wonderful conversation. Can I just one quick one here because I see there's and thanks for the comments on the chat which I'm just catching up with but someone has asked me how to make the film shown in a theater in the city so my U.S. distributor is called Level 33 L-E-V-E-L -E -E number 33. Um, they would be the folks to contact if you and I'm, I could give you a direct contact um, email with them if maybe you want to put it through partners to send out to me and then I'll I'll get the email back to you that's probably the, the best way because I don't know if their direct contact info would be on their website but I can certainly get you to the people to uh, to talk to if you have a theater in your hometown that you want to uh, convince to show the, the film Oh, okay. thank you. Let me copy that, Connie, and then I'll I'll write to you directly. If I can do that, can I copy from chat? Anyway, sorry, don't mean to hold everybody up. No, no I'll, worries. I'll figure it out. <laughs> Thanks again. All right.
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Jason, we can get it to you and. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's best. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank care, you. Everyone. And thanks to Ben. <laughs>